afternoon, everybody. In the name of the European Union Office, I wanted to thank Hong Kong TDC, the Book Fair, and Kitty and her team for making this possible. And of course, thank, special thanks to Ms. Celia Hava, who is the winner of the European Union Prize for Literature, and Mr. Chit Sao for being here today and, uh, and uh, producing a fantastic uh, session that I think is going to be thrilling for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We have a rare uh, intellectual visitor from a country that not many Hong Kong people have or are planning to visit, uh, have visited or planning to visit very often. However, Finland is a country I've been to for a few times. I just came back from Helsinki about three months ago, right? And um, it is, well, thank you. Thank the uh, TDC and the book fair that would just expand our horizon of reading by inviting such a well-known, renowned, outstanding um, writer, right, whose work has just received the EU Prize for Literature, to come to Hong Kong to share her or or the um, uh, or, or, or the country's uh, literary experiences uh, with those who live here. Now, the title, I like to start with the title, Hidden in Plain Sight. I mean, many argue that good literature is always produced from turbulence, miseries, sufferings, and wars, right? I mean, we had the, Odys uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, earliest product of Western lit literature as an outcome of the Trojan War. And then in modern age, we have Kafka's um, works, right? Um, literature written under uh, repression or uh, some sort of uh, depression. Or Hundred Years Solitude, a famous literature from a Latin American country. Uh, from that to the unbearable lightness of uh, being written by a Czech writer during the communist dictatorship era. Right? And um, even Shakespeare's plays, right, although written apparently in the flourishing and, um, and the money-making Elizabethan uh, uh, England, however, it was Shakespeare's work was the result of um, some sort of civil war between the Protestant church and the Roman Catholics. But for countries like um, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, you have people there are blessed with democracy, liberty, stable and good government, and um, rich natural resources with salmon and seas and wood and forests and you have been living a very good life for hundreds of years, despite the tiny scuffles with, of wars with the Russians, right? But there's nothing compared with the sufferings of some peoples in the third world countries. How could good literature be produced? <laughs> and how would a citizen born in those countries meet such challenges uh, by searching your own muse in your own social context of material comfort and, um, and uh, stability. Or, or, in countries like that, you discover your own dark side of human nature there, right? Now, before uh, passing the microphone to you, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes to talk about my experience with uh, Finland. And I'd like to invite you to have a look at this painting I um, discovered from uh, the National Art Museum in Helsinki, right? Who has got the, uh, who's got the computer? Right? <laughs> No? Okay. 
Well, okay. Oh, sorry. I'm very bad with computer. Would you be kind enough to operate by showing that painting? Okay, I leave it to you to sort that out. I think uh, we'll let the writer talk about her feelings and experiences about what could be hidden in plain sight. I don't know whether you've read, uh, you have read this book yet. You haven't. <laughs> Buy a copy and try to read it because uh, it's written in plain and easy but lucid and good English. Right? And, uh, it is about three stories, characters knitted together by, with three accidental events that apparently have no relationship. It's okay, it's okay. Now, okay. Well, maybe better not for me to waste too much time, right? You start it off. <laughs> How would you discover your muse in what you may? have uh, expressed in the theme of this novel, mm. Hidden in Plain Sight. Why did you, what inspired you into writing this novel? Yes, um, hello from me as well, and thank you for inviting me um, to Hong Kong, where I've never been before. Um, I chose this topic um, as it is something that kind of, um, bothers me as a writer at the moment. This relationship between the personal experience and then fiction, um, and how, how one's personal experiences travel and become um, fiction and art. And um, it is, um, I found my way to this question through two things really. One of them was that uh, my latest novel called um, Before My Husband Disappears, um, so the one that came after this um, novel in Finnish, was very much based on my personal experience. And um, I wasn't um, maybe prepared to realize how much it affects the reader's ex uh, reception of the book when they know that it is based on a real events. And I almost felt like um, um, the literary side of the work was somehow uh, rejected or not acknowledged at all. Um, and I found it a bit frustrating as, a, as an author. Um, then the second thing was that I've, not that long ago I spoke to one of my friends who was, um, 
we've talked about the new book that I'm writing now, which is based on a, a female character from the 17th century German Germany, um, and she was a naturalist and interested in insects. And my friend was saying to me that maybe, maybe it won't be so hard for you with this new book because it's less personal subject. Um, and I kind of understand what she meant, but at the same time I felt like, why does she feel that this is less personal than the previous book? Just because the main character is not so obviously me. That, um, that I still have a very personal connection with this book. And um, that, that something that, that this feeling of, of um, intimacy with the subject matter is not just about real life stories or real life characters, but um, it can also be something like the voice of the narrator can feel um, um, intimate. And, and I feel like I'm revealing something about myself as a writer, just revealing this voice that, that I'm, well, I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, so these, um, this is why I've been thinking about the, 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 the personal side of, of writing fiction recently. Um, and as an author, of course, um, I use myself. Myself is, uh, is my tool. It is part of the instrument that I operate with. Um, and I... Um, um, and I... I have to take care of my own instrument. Um, I have to feed my own imagination, and I, I do listen to myself um, and try to verbalize experiences that I have, like, like now coming to this country, which is very different from where I've been. Um, before, uh, yesterday, as I was walking around, I was quite sensitive to how it feels also to the feeling of how does it feel to be so alone because I don't know anybody I don't understand the language I don't understand the writing and how does it make me feel and these are sort of experiences that I can use in my writing maybe in some totally different context but um, so this is how how I practice my instrument, which is myself. Um, of course, the simplest way um, of, of um, writing about your own per uh, experiences is that you take a real life event or real life character and then place that in your fiction. These are also the sort of things that readers notice the easiest. Um, but of course, when you write something from real life into fiction, you, you mix it up, you blur it, um, you twist it, you distort it, because um, you don't have to, as a fiction writer, you don't have to be loyal to the original event, the, the, the memory, because you can, you, you only need to be loyal to the sort of meaning that you give for that memory. Um, um, and fiction doesn't have to be true, that's the whole lovely point of it. There's also a kind of uncontrollable element when you write that you might, um, the text doesn't always obey the writer's agenda. Um, I remember when I was young and I was writing uh, about my grandmother who, were, who, who was very dear to me and a very important person and I, I really thought she was quite cool. And, uh, and then I started writing about her. And in my writing, she turned into an awful 
bitch, I mean, really nasty side, and I was really surprised um, and kind of unpre unprepared to um, see her from that perspective. But there was nothing I could uh, do about it. It was that this horrible side of her kind of came out only when I wrote about her. And maybe this is also a, a way writing can be, we can be as writers, we can be wiser and braver than we are in normal life, that we, are, we can see certain things that we don't maybe want to see in normal circumstances. Um, there's also subjects that appear even if we don't want them to appear or that maybe we don't even recognize them themselves. We, we keep repeating certain themes or or scenes, or characters, or setups, um, and um, like all my three books that I've written so far, they are dealing with the subject of loss, whether it's a loss of memory or loss of somebody um, you love, or loss of identity but there's always this element of loss. And it's not something that I fully know where, where this need comes from for me to write about it, but clearly it is something that I carry with me because I keep returning to it. There's also certain images that get repeated, like the white line in the cover of this English translation of the book. It is some, the, the, the need to somehow define something with an outline, um, define a dead body on the floor, or define a subject, or define my own presence somehow. Um, it is something that I have kept doing, and this image of the white line of, uh, uh, around a dead body is something that I've uh, repeated, um, also in the performance work that I've done in the past. And. Um, And they are kind of, I don't, as a writer, I don't really need to know why I keep repeating it. It's enough for me to acknowledge that it's there. Often these things get an explanation at some point later. Um, often fiction is also a kind of blurry mix of something very personal and then something totally made up and alienated. I quite like to plant my own very private thoughts and questions and experiences into um, strain, strangers. <laughs> like um, in, with my first book, um, I was describing a very personal experience of not being able to be present in a moment, kind of losing um, kind of absence. Um, um, and um, maybe some sort of element of depression as well. But I planted these experiences into a very old woman's mind. So the book became a description of Alzheimer's which wasn't really what I was, <laughs> I wasn't, um, I hadn't started with. And often when I um, go to readings with that book, people come and ask me, how could you dis uh, um, describe Alzheimer's experience so well as you are so, such a young person? And, uh, and the truth was that I'm, I wasn't describing that. I was describing something else, but I gave it a different skin and it became something else. And I think this is something that literature can do. Uh, and I think there's a big potential there for it that we can share an experience or of, of reach out and touch somebody else's experience, even when we come from a very different place. And maybe because we don't have the images, like for instance, film has, that the, the, somehow the 
pure voice that we have in a book is, is um, it gives more opportunity for that connection of sharing, uh, of understanding the sameness that very different people have. Um, and that's not a, that's not a small thing. <laughs> Um, also, sometimes text can be more personal than you realize when you are writing it. And like this was definitely the case with this book, Things That Fall From The Sky. I didn't feel that it was such a, it w that it was based on my personal experience when I was writing it, because there's none of that really on the kind of obvious surface of it. And it actually took me several years um, to make that connection. Um, I was actually in a reading that was full of psychotherapists <laughs> and uh, it was there, some sort of um, seminar. And uh, we were discussing this book and then one of the audience members said to me that um, the, the main character in the book is a little girl of eight years old. And, and um, she said that, um, well, the girl in the book, I mean, she is left really alone in this situation, that none of the adults really help her at all. And then all the, the other psychotherapists in the audience were sort of nodding um, in unison. And then suddenly, it was a moment when I realized that um, I've actually written myself as a child there, and I haven't realized it. I mean, several years had passed after publishing the book, and, and, um, and um, I felt so stupid and so exposed and ashamed that it had been there all along, and I just hadn't realized it. And I think this is something that... It's, it's a good thing that it happens in writing, that you expose... Third, you're not in control of the process, and you expose things that you weren't even aware of um, yourself. I mean, that is part of the thing that makes writing interesting, that unknown things happen. Um, but also, as a last thing, um, the process doesn't always go so that first there are real life events and then you write about it. Um, that somehow, sometimes the, the direction can be the opposite. And uh, this, um, that you first write about something and then it happens. I know there's several authors who have experiences of this, that they, for instance, write about a disease and then they get the disease. Or that they write some about some other event and then it happens. And this was very much what happened with this book, because the book tells about different characters who, from whom the life pulls rug, rug from underneath their feet. So something unexpected and uh, happens without a reason, without a meaning, and then they struggle to make sense of it, and they struggle to continue their life because they don't know what the point is now. And uh, <clears throat> when I was finishing this book, like two months before the deadline, this very thing happened to me, and suddenly it was like I became one of these characters who are just, I don't know what to do next. <laughs> and then I found myself in this same position. Um, and it was very weird. And then there was, um, then other things started leaking from this book into reality as well. There's a ghost in the book. And suddenly I had a ghost in my house. And um, then there was, um, the, the second part of the book is a letter, a letter correspondence between a woman who's been very lucky because she's won the lottery win twice, and then there's a man who's been very unlucky because he get, gets hit by lightning several times. And they write letters to each other, 
um, although one of them is kind of stuck in a positive circle and the other one is stuck in a negative circle, they share this, these questions, like what's going on, what's happening to me. And again, this leaked into my life. I was having a very difficult time in my own personal life. And my friend, my best friend, won the biggest book prize in Finland that same week. And he, he couldn't deal with it, and I couldn't deal with what was happening to me. And we were, <laughs> we were sort of having these discussions. It, it felt like he's the only person who can understand me. And, um, and then, because he had read this script before, uh, unfinished, and he said to me, that, look, Celia, this is just like from your book. This is a bit weird. <laughs> and... Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a very strange, bit, almost like a mystical experience. And it is partly why I feel quite connected this, with this work, that there is something inexplicable in it still to me. Um, but it kind of showed that um, there's, um, there's a lot that we can't really be in control of when we are writing. And that intuition, which is part of that sensitivity, part of practicing that instrument that I talked about in the beginning, that um, it can do wonderful and <laughs> strange things. And then one last thing is that also when you write about real life events, the price you pay is that sometimes you lose the original memory. Because when you write it into fiction, that kind of, you, you mix it, you blur it, you twist it, and you remember better that um, fictional version of the original event. And that's sort of, yeah, I, that is the price you sometimes pay. Right, thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation. Well, that explains a little bit what I have been wondering. I mean, in a country like Finland, sufferings are always caused by accident, accidents mm -hmm. rather than man-made uh, man uh, social or political tragedies. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I mean, you don't have the a tyrannical uh, uh, military governments who lock up people, you know, and uh, and um, people knocking on the door at night, you know, because you have said something uh, wrong or some or something uh, um, that has offended the government, as in uh, the unbearable lightness of being. Mm -hmm. Now, the stories that happen, the story that happens in this country, uh, in this in this book is a uh, generator from pure accidents. An eight-year-old girl, you know, with her mothers walking in the streets, suddenly things that, f things that fall from the sky, as indicated by the title, a piece of ice fell down, which fits into the climate of uh, Finland, and the mother is killed, right? And then the girl moved in with her aunt, with her father. The aunt has won the lottery, before, and after that, she wins another jackpot, so very lucky. And then she starts corresponding, writing to a Scotsman, who, uh, in a remote country, has been uh, struck by lightning for five times. That's a little bit incredible. <laughs> so, I mean, how come all these uh, uh, being lucky or unlucky minds or persons uh, be connected, and for it is the job for the writer trying to find out meanings out of apparently plain and uh, and uh, accidental episodes of life. Mm. <laughs> I think this is the aspect of life that I've always been interested. And you've just said that yeah. it echoes your own experience. Yeah. Yes. Um, it also echoes a very early experience of, um, 
I think I, w I was five when my cousin died and she was a few years older than me. But I think if you experience that as a child, that even another child can die. I think that the, all the, the, it kind of collapses the idea of there being fairness or somehow um, that events have a purpose. Um, I think it is um, something that can't be justified by anything. And I think that it, it's only through this book that I've kind of realized how yes. much that experience, very early childhood experience, is still within me and in, in the way I look at the world. So a lot of people, many people ask the same question, young girls, young secondary school children. I want to write stories, I want to be writers, you know, but I have no experiences. How can I start? Right? Always start with something you are familiar with, a kind of experience you are familiar with, and, and that episode of, of uh, drama, if you call it, or, or sudden moment, how it struck you with uh, uh, a stirring of emotion, mm. right? no matter how light that stirring could be, and then write it down. It's usually how a writer would start uh, his first work. Yes. I, I, when I teach writing, I often start with an exercise yes. like this that describe a moment from your childhood when you yes. learned or realized mm. something for the first time. And it's those little moments of, you mentioned drama, and the, 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 the mechanism of drama, yes. the change, yes. is, is, um, comes out in those stories. Yes. And as you said, they don't have to be big and tragic, no. but they are real life moments, yes. and they often produce good yes. uh, writing. The people here, are, well, people in the world of this generation are too used to watching Hollywood movies, Harry Potter, you know, used to watching TV series or whatever, but they expect one Kung Fu kick scene followed by another, you know, punching in the face um, surprise, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't, they don't get patient and they're waiting for the writer to tell them something shocking, mm -hmm. but it doesn't need to be. I mean, we have to get beyond that kind of visual or emotional labyrinth, right? Of, uh, of dramatic stirring and get beyond that and find right, a, uh, what, what, what drama in life could be defined. I mean, your book has reminded me of um, an early work by James Joyce, a collection of short stories called The Dubliners. It's a collection of short stories. Each of it, each of it doesn't tell a very dramatic story at all. For example, the first story is the monologue, a kind of monologue seen through the eye of a kid, right? Because an old lady, she has been know he had been he has been knowing for years, passed away, right? So, the first story is called the sisters. What is it about? It's about his experience of uh, witnessing a funeral, right? the death of a person whom he finds familiar. <laughs> and he doesn't know what the meaning of death is. Mm. So he just recalls what he sees, the, the white candles, you know, the coffins, and all of a sudden that old lady who's, who's been so kind, who's been smiling at me, is no more. Mm. And that's it, a brief moment of uh, recollection of emotions. Um, experienced by a five or six year old child, although he doesn't know what the word uh, death means. Mm -hmm. right? And it is a kind of literature I, th I found that I find touching and moving the most, but only to be appreciated um, when you grow a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And that collection is ended with another short story called The Dead. It deals with the same theme of death, but it's, it happens to, uh, it happens as a as a talking as a conversation topic among a group of uh, of uh, partying guests, right? And then it ends with the snowing scene outside the window, a very famous one, whose lines has been quote, have been quoted in the latest movie called uh, The Wife. I don't know whether you've seen that. You know, um, uh, uh, I think. Um, 
the wife has been nominated for the best uh, actress for Oscar this year. Right? That's how literature moves mm. and touches. Okay? So I think, yes, I mean, I like to uh, render your work and you perhaps in the background of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Scandinavia, right? I mean, there is, yes, I mean, you talk about um, the uh, stirring of emotions, but still, these emotions I experience in uh, rather quiet and tranquil or plain life as uh, we face in uh, a, a, a materially comfortable um, and socially stable country like Finland. Mm. <laughs> but accidents do happen. Mm. So whoever would like to write stories, whether it is, uh, or, or, or whether would like, or whoever would like to uh, uh, try a little bit of literature writing, should it be it poetry or novels, just to start with any of your uh, experiences. Just be sensitive, perhaps. <laughs> but somehow, being a little bit oversensitive could pay a price on the part of the writer, mm -hmm. as you have just experienced mm -hmm. yourself. Right? The disappearing of your husband or whatever, you know, that kind of thing is how one could take. Right? You have mm -hmm. to stay strong, perhaps to go to see a good friend or doctor or whatever to mm -hmm. get over this. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you could collect a crystallized byproduct like this um, novel. Mm. <laughs> now, I like to read our, uh, some paragraphs, you know, and uh, study what literature and try to find out what literature literature is really like. Sometimes aeroplane spring leaks, say in a water pipe or the toilet. That's a fact. If the water that drips out is blue, it's from the toilet. If it's clear, it comes from somewhere else. If the aeroplane is stationary, the drops of water will just fall straight down to the ground. Up in the air, the seeping water will freeze because of the low temperature outside. A lump of ice that forms during a long flight can be big as, a as big as a football. When the aeroplane loses altitude and the air temperature rises, the chunk of rice might detach itself from the aeroplane and drop down on the ground. Ice is the common, most common thing to fall from an aeroplane. And when underneath there's somebody's garden where a person in the middle of planting a strawberry pimerate is doing jobs, that individual might be hit on the head with a lump of ice the size of a football and die. That's a fact. <laughs> I mean, those two, these two paragraphs deal with uh, some kind of physical fact, but it conveys a rather hidden but sad sense of humor. <laughs> yes, I, I, yes, that I think it is an example of my sense of humor. <laughs> I do. But a sad sense yeah, of humor, yes, right? Yes, I do find kind of this combination of grim and, and um, bizarre, quite funny. Um, and um, and the, the book has many little stories like this where something, um, well, I do find it funny as well that a man gets hit by lightning for several <laughs> times yes. and uh, that people start being afraid of being close to him when there's bad thundery... <laughs> or curse, curse yeah. by God. Yes, <laughs> that if there's bad clouds in the sky, they prefer to stand a little bit further away mm. from him. And at the same time, of course, it's really tragic. Yes. Um, and... Um, But I guess, yes, there is something that appeals, appeals to me in those combinations. Yeah, because I think it's, uh, it's rather common that uh, when we read the news of a guy being hit by lightning, I mean, we had a case a few months ago when a, 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 a mountain hiker was hit by lightning somewhere in Ma, Ma On Shan, you know, when he was taking that long walk. I think most of the um, response from the net, right, mm -hmm. on the internet or forums 
has been laughed at, mm. rather than uh, feeling sorry. Mm. Oh, you've been really lucky. And according to the Chinese culture of superstition, now you must have done something really bad in uh, your early life or your previous life. Mm. You have been nasty to your parents because as we say, in, uh, every, as we believe in Cantonese, right? If you don't treat your parents well, you get hit by a lightning. <laughs> but how? <laughs> but how? Mm. Right? And then we see the lightning as a god, mm. just like uh, in the mythology of, uh, of uh, the Nordic, Nordic uh, um, mythology, mm. right? <laughs> mm. So it's somehow the accidentalities looks too absurd. Right, yes. that it changes from a tra it, it just converts a tragedy into some kind of well, not comedy but a farce, mm. and that that um, transference could perhaps make us aware of the accident uh, of the uh, uh, accidentality mm. of life and death. That it could happen just so easily. So we are not laughing just at the unlucky person that is. Uh, struck by the uh, by the lightning, but it all it is always accompanied by a sense of precariousness. Mm. <laughs> and there's also the because it, it these sort of elements are um, reminders to us that anything could happen, yes. even to me today, tomorrow. So I'm not safe either because we nobody is nobody is safe. But we it's quite. For mental health, it's quite important be to believe that I am safe. Yes. Um, so we have all these different ways of, of um, creating kind of illusionary mm. safety for ourselves. We um, don't take things for granted. Mm. There are terrorist attacks everywhere. Yesterday I was talking to a French writer who came from Paris and who's about to change his flight to Egypt and who hesitated about doing that, Bernard Werber, because he's just been told that uh, there was some terrorist attack plot hatching against uh, Britain, right? Against British flights, so Air France might think that it could also be affected, but who knows? Mm. I know a friend of a friend who just died on the a Malaysian airline flight from Amsterdam on the way to uh, to uh, Kuala Lumpur, right for the conf uh, for the for a conference, and that flight was taken down by a, by I think by a, a, some Russian uh, or spon a Russian sponsored uh, troops over there. I mean, there was a tragedy a couple of years ago, and the guy told me he was quite young. He only graduated from university. He was in his early 20s. He was working in, um, in Geneva, right, as a social worker. And that expert was sitting, simply sitting opposite to him. They were talking to each other every day, going to the canteen. And one day he told him, I'm, I'm going to on, on to a business trip to uh, Kuala Lumpur with a group of medical experts. Right? And all of a sudden, he never came back. <laughs> um, there's also a little event uh, that I've written into that book because I wanted to, it to be there but this is how I, I lived in London in 1999 and um, I, I just missed a, a, a bomb explosion in a supermarket by half, less than half a minute I was um, packing my shopping um, and then as I was packing the shopping, um, the bomb went off by the doorway. So the security guy who was standing there got pretty badly injured and um, nothing happened to me. And uh, so nothing happened. <laughs> but it kind of started off this um, circle of questions that don't really have very good answers like why was I in that supermarket that particular day why because normally I went to a different supermarket so I went there because the bus was late so why was the bus late and and then um, if I had chosen different yogurt if I had st stood there 
10 minutes or 10 seconds shorter, I would have been by the doorway when the bomb went off. So why did I choose this yogurt? And, <laughs> and then, of course, there's no answers to any of these questions. Um, and it just sort of shows that you can't prepare. Mm. And it was really uncomfortable because at the same time, nothing happened. Mm. So I was safe. And, and, and people around me didn't really understand that. Yeah. They just said that, oh, you were really lucky. Whew. And let's move on. <laughs> yeah, that's all. And, and so I was left very alone, lonely with those mm. questions that didn't have yes. proper answers. The closest thing that happened to me was a few months ago, you know, as you may have heard of. There was an explosion at a church in Sri Lanka, killing more than 300 people. And there were two Australians, an Australian Sri Lankan mother with her 13-year-old daughter called Alessandra, right? And the mother had just come to Hong Kong three months before, and we had dinner together, talking about Sri Lankan cultural marketing, right? And she told me how what Sri Lanka is really like, and she told me a little bit about the colonial past of the British rule, and we got on very well on the dinner, and she invited me to go to Sri Lanka to visit her in autumn, and after two or three months, all of a sudden, I learned of this terrorist attack, this explosion in a church. And then, after half an hour, I got a text from a mutual friend. She died there with a daughter. And her husband became, was heartbroken. And the husband went to the church with the wife and the daughter because they had not been getting on well. Even if they, have, they had just sat down on the on the bench in the church, the wife told her, well, this, well the, the visitor, well, I mean, we, um, is the lady I met at the Yixan restaurant or in Wen Chai. Go out and park the car properly because the car was not parked properly. Come on, get out and do it. Otherwise, you get a tick from the police or whatever. So grudgingly, the husband raised up and went out. As soon as he stepped out, he heard this huge explosion. He looked back and rushed back, and the wife and the daughter were no more. Mm. <laughs> right? I mean, that is a very, really extreme moment of mm. what you call serpentity. Right? Serip what was the word? That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perhaps that answers. You know, your questions partly, but it happens to it happens to many people. You know whose relative or friends you know have well meet such uh, or, 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 or or have met such tragic moments. But what a writer differs from other people is how you would turn this into something more interesting and a novel or a poem that would also move other people. Mm. And like the little girl in my book, Sarah, she, um, she, she believes in stories and in, in story structures as well. And it was something that she used to do with her mother, that she, the mother would tell her stories. And, um, and then also Sarah likes um, the detective stories, Hercule Poirot, um, because those sort of detective stories, they have always a very set structure. There's one question, who was the murderer in the beginning, and then the story ends when you get the answer. And th this sort of satisfies her, this form, format, that... Uh, all, all the elements that you have in the story are sort of linked to this main question, who, who was the murderer? So nothing is irrelevant, everything connects. And when Sarah's mother dies with a block of ice from the airplane falling on her head, it kind of, she can't really fit this event into the story structure that she's grown up with. 
like how can a main one of the main characters die? Uh, what's the point of this? Um, and she struggles. The whole last part of the book is dealing with the question of how to end a story when the story has gone wrong, when it's gone sort of off the tracks. Um, and uh, and it kind of shows that um, none of the characters in the book they can they can't go back to the old way of to the old story format because it's revealed itself as being um, um, in ad, um, um, what's the word insufficient yes. and. Of course, I was also struggling with the same question with my writing the book. Like, how do I, if, if the book is sort of struggling, if it if shows people that whose stories have gone off the track and they don't know how to continue, then how to finish a book yes. that talks about those mm. people? You can't just finish it as a yeah. normal story. So, how did you construct this story? Mm. Right? I mean, we know the backbone, right? The theme, life is precarious. Mm. Mm. Accidents could happen all of a sudden, and that's the backbone. How would you, from that backbone, build up a skeleton mm. and then put flesh and blood, all the details in it, so that you know, it is completed as an interesting uh, work of literary art? Mm. The details. Right. Do you start with the, the ending or the characters, mm. right, and then put the details later, or, or just simply start with a philosophical statement, mm. boring statement like oh, "life is precarious," mm. and then that's all. I normally start from several places at the same time. I start with the details. I don't know yet what they are going to talk about. I um, work in quite a fragmented way. So often my manuscripts are pretty fragmented for a long time. Uh, I also, the way I work is that I write on different days to different parts of the manuscript. So I don't start from the beginning and finish with the ending. I often call it like a cauliflower. That it kind of, it spreads from a bunch of ideas and it expands. Um, so it's not like a linear thing. Um, and um, because I have drama background, the structural side of it is quite important to me as well. So I, there's, I draw maps of the material that I have. In advance, in advance. Uh, no, not in one, uh, not alongside. In, alongside mm. it. It's often a sort of, I check up what I have now or the, where the problem lies. And I, I realize where the problem lies through drawing a map of, of structural map of some sort. So things so. develop yeah. slowly yes. and gradually. So yes. that's rather different from what you uh, start to hatching yes. on day one. Yes. Uh, and the characters, one. and then you let go. Yeah, right? and that's the best part of it, that I'm not in control, and it surprises me. That's a it, mystic yeah. experience, mm. as if, as you say, there's a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> or there's a force up there, yeah. you know, uh, somewhere mm. to uh, drive your hand and your thoughts mm. to write, um, write out their stories in a parallel universe, perhaps. Mm. Right? That's why I think a writer is, is a medium, right? Mm. Perhaps. There's an element of Rather that, yes. yeah. Because, yeah. right. um, as I said, it's not just that. I have an experience and then I write about it. But it's much more complex process that yes. goes back and forth and, and um, uncontrolled mm -hmm. things happen. So your own emotions or sentiments or experiences are raw stuff, mm. right? And then something trigger them and turn them or convert them into a, uh, a, a story so that it becomes uh, shareable mm -hmm. with other people and peoples of uh, foreign countries as mm. well. That's the power of literature, perhaps. Mm. Right. It's been quite interesting. The book has been translated to quite many, well, um, 19 languages now. And um, it's resonated quite strongly in Eastern Europe. And I think there's a reason for that. Which in English, the English readers will love it. 
Yeah, because their life is, you know. Yeah, at the moment, yes. Yeah, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, with the Eastern European uh, experience, I think there's something that resonates with this sort of yes. story that uh, things fall from the sky and it's, it's not. The mess controlled. they face called mm. Brexit mm. <laughs> could have started with one flimsical, crazy thought by a prime minister called mm. David Cameron, mm. right? Before she made, he made that decision, on the previous night, had his wife been strong enough to <laughs> stop him, things could have been totally different. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a feminist in that sense. <laughs> right, so who knows? Just like how First World War broke up. Mm. Just a bullet that should not have been fired by six anarchist uh, students. Mm. And the car on which um, the, um, the crown prince of, uh, of, um, oh, yeah, of a uh, Hungarian uh, empire, right? Mm. The driver had taken a wrong turn, right? <laughs> and the car had, was driving away from where the six students ambushed. Mm. And the leader of the six students had been waiting, and he didn't see the car, and was watching his clock. So the car was not coming. Okay, let's go. Mm. Call it a day. And then the driver, almost at the same time, realized he had gone the wrong way. So he turned his wheel back, oh, in order not to be late, because the Duke was being taken to do a ribbon-cutting ceremony mm. at the new county hall, whatever. So as the car made a U-turn, right, or, or somewhere, and then started appearing at the far corner of the street. The student leader saw it and said, hey, stop, he's coming. Let's get back to the ambush position and aim. And then the crown prince was killed. That resulted in the death of more than two, uh, 20 million people mm. in Europe. I mean, that's really spooky. Mm. And uh, that was 100 years ago. Mm. <laughs> So that is what you call a dramatic tension. Mm. So you manage to build a lot of dramatic tension out of um, seemingly accidental uh, uh, episodes that happen in life. Mm. So thank you very much. Now, I managed to find that uh, a finished painting. I'd like to invite you to have a look. And this is a painting by a Finnish um, artist called Albert Elderfeld, right? And I was, when I visited the National Museum in Helsinki, I was, um, <coughs> I stood in front of this painting for quite a long time. Well, is it, it is a scene that uh, we in Hong Kong physically found unfamiliar, right? Because when you have a relative who passes away, you go to the funeral home in North Point, right, Banjikun, and then the coffin is usually shipped to uh, the crematorium somewhere near Stanley. But this painting, right, is about, we have a, we see a boat, and the middle of the painting is this about six or five or six year old kid holding a flower. Behind him, there is this gray uh, casket which indicates a coffin, right? Because, why? Because there's a cross leaning on it. So the painting gives more and more details as your sight is led or invited by the painter to explore his work. And then what happened? And then there's an old lady, lady dressed in black, holding apparently a book. So it, is log it would be logical to think that it is the Bible and then she looks sad, and then what do you, and then what do you have? You have the bearded man holding the oar, rowing the boat with his hands, holding the oar firmly, right? And he seems to be one of the two men on the boat. And with a reasonable guess, you could think that he could be the father or the uncle of the child. And then his body covers another lady seated next to him. And then the most remote one is this woman 
looking away and at the lake, right? And then what do you get? Right, your sight is drawn back to the central figure, the child. He's only five or six year old, years old. And look at his face, a kind of sadness that should not be worn on that face at that age. Right? He's only a child, as young as uh, the boy there, right? But he experiences the feelings of the meaning of departure for good at that age. So it invites an audience to guess who could be the one lying in the coffin, right? That's how I see, that's how I think a piece of art could be touching. And there's so much meaning hidden in a plain sight, right? It's a boat of a family, boat loaded family, um, with a child seated in the middle of a boat, and it's about um, a funeral. The coffin is going to be taken away, and the sadness is felt by the five-year-old kid. It's a bit too early, but he feels it. It makes us wonder, when this boy grows up, what kind of person he's going to be. <laughs> is he going to be a philosopher? Is that, does that episode in life that happens to him make him a little bit, excuse me, a little bit more mature? Right? There are all possibilities, and there are, all, there are messages all hidden in every single inch of, of, of space of this painting, right? And then uh, um, you see the light, the reflection of the light on the edge. The irony is this seems to be a morning, right? And for this child, it's the morning of his life. Yet, he's taking the coffin of a beloved one who could be his own mother to a place far away, right, to bid farewell. And I was standing in front of this painting. I felt very touched. All of a sudden, it's something that plain, you know, but the sense of humanity is there, that link, link up an audience from Hong Kong with the painter, the artist, and with this perhaps fictitious uh, character, the child, you know, in the painting. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the power of art, the power of literature, mm -hmm. right? So this is uh, how I have been enlightened on the trip to Finland, right? <laughs> and uh, thank you. Right, Thank and you. you are the sec my second enlightenment <laughs> with your great work. <laughs> yes, of course. So, what is the difference between an autobiographical fiction uh, and a memoir? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, with memoir, there's this expectation of of uh, it being true, uh, it being loyal to what really happened. Um, then, of course. Um, what we call autofiction is more like literature that has a link to something that really happened, but there are other elements in that fiction as well. So it's not totally reliable memoir as such. Um, but then, of course, then there's a whole spectrum of, of variations in how much and what sort of autobiographical material you might have hidden in your work. Yeah. And as I said, you're not always even aware of it as an author, um, what you've revealed <laughs> there. Oh, I think I started wanting to be an author when I was six. <laughs> so it was, um, um, uh, yeah, my grandmother, this nasty woman in the <laughs> fictional character, she was a painter. So I think I, I quite um, 
looked up to her way of living. Um, so I think that was one um, kind of image for my future that I had uh, growing up with her. But I think it was, it was very early on that I felt like writing was the way I can express myself. I've wrote diaries from very early on, and I was quite a passionate diary writer for many years. Um, and then when I went to study, I, I went to a writing school. Then I went to the drama school that taught script writing. Um, so it was always the thing that I kind of followed. But then, of course, to become a, a, a publishing author is then not so simple because it's not totally up to you <laughs> to become one. So um, I, I guess I was lucky <laughs> to have my work published as well. So most, most early works of novelists are autobiographical anyway, yeah. such as uh, David Copperfield as for uh, Charles Dickens. Right? They say that often the first book you write, that, yeah. there's, that there's one story in every writer, yes. and you have to write that out first. Yes. And then you can start writing yes. other stuff or making it mm. up. Mm. But um, So it, it often is the case that the first novel is the autobiographical one. Um, in my case, it was a little bit different because I wrote a film first. So the film was the, the story that I had to write out. So my first novel is the one that tells about Alzheimer or memory loss. So it, this <laughs> theory didn't really um, yeah, prove itself with that one. But of course, writing is something that you can also start quite late on in your life. It's one of those merciful um, um, professions that you can still start in your 40s, 50s, 60s even. Uh, with, when it comes to many other art forms, there's a lot of um, technical training that you need to do quite early on to be able... You can't become a professional dancer if you start in your late 30s. Um, but with writing, there's less technique. Um, drama, drama is a m bit more technical form of literature. But yes. for writing a film, you have to think of the box office, mm. yes, and follow a rule of the market, certain rules of the market. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Not at all, actually. It was just, I'm, today I've been talking about from this perspective, but if you look at the kind of the, the narrative um, elements or the character elements of that book, there's none of it is, is um, I've made it up. <laughs> but um, it's, um, maybe it, that's why it's kind of interesting to look at it from the, the from that pers from the autobiographical perspective, um, that um, to realise afterwards that actually there's a lot more there than I realised originally. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It does feel, it does feel strange. And with the more recent book, which was more obviously based on my own life, it was even more difficult because somehow that um, the book was judged, and I felt like I was being judged. And of course, uh, the narrator of that book is not somebody that. Um, I'm very proud of. <laughs> it was quite a raw image of that person. And, um, 
And because um, in some ways that book was dealing with um, somebody reaching their limits, like, like somebody not being able to be as honorable or great or strong as they were hoping or thinking they would be. So it was like I was sharing quite a shameful side of myself. And then when that narrator gets criticized for being um, limited and, and all the rest of it, of course it was like I felt like it was criticism towards me. Um, and it also kind of showed that in some ways, um, as readers, we don't always want to read um, about characters who are not brave and successful and who fail. And that it can be difficult to bear to read about that side of um, life where things don't go like you want to. And it was, um, of course, it was not comfortable fully to write about that side of things either. Um, so yeah, with, with that book, definitely there was a, a, a challenging part of it as well. Um, and I think it is... Um, mm, there's always that sort of element of exposure uh, in, in writing. It might be that the readers don't even realize that it's there because maybe it's not so obvious what's being exposed. Um, I remember a story about a choreographer who, who had done a piece, a dance piece. He thought it was just deeply personal. He felt like, oh God, he's exposing everything. Whereas for a viewer, it was just a totally abstract contemporary dance piece. <laughs> and he spoke to his tutor, going like, oh, oh God, am, am I, you know, am I showing it all now? And she said that, I don't even know what you're talking about. So sometimes it isn't so obvious what, what's in the work. I think when I begin my work, I don't really re think about the reader at all. It only comes in towards the end of it. So um, <clears throat> the, the initial impulse is, is always something quite, it comes from me. But of course, like with the previous book, which was based so much on my own story, um, I, I was sick with myself. <laughs> I didn't, when it came to, writing again, I thought that I'm just, I don't want to hear this voice at all. I want a different voice now. So this is partly why I ended up with the woman from the 17th century Germany, <laughs> that um, I wanted distance. But of course, as I work with that woman from the 17th century Germany, it's not so alien anymore. Um, so of course, I have to make a connection with her for, for it to make any sense for me. And, and it's interesting because I'm quite uncomfortable now with her because she's quite religious, as everybody was in those days. But I find she's talking about God all the time. Uh, she's dealing with the questions of nature and creation and um, insect development and so much forth. And at the time, this was all always linked to um, God, of course. And um, 
I noticed that I'm really, I feel really embarrassed about having this voice in me that wants to talk about um, God, because um, it's not very fashionable nowadays, of course. <laughs> and um, and I do, I don't really know fully yet where that's un, that uneasiness comes from, but I, I kind of, I take it as a good sign, because I, I feel like, okay, this it, it is relevant somehow to me, what I'm working on. Um, so, yes, I guess there, there is, so in a sense, yes, the audience perception in certain way affects maybe what, what you end up working with. Next. Yes, it's quite courageous because the world is obsessed with privacy now. Yeah? Mm. You tend to hide anything, not that uh, secret, rather than the other way around. Mm. So I think it's a, it's a good way of uh, starting literature. Right. You work against your the mindset of uh, privacy and try to uh, uh, write out uh, how you feel. <laughs> if you feel depressed or repressed. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? So, can you tell us a little bit? about the next work you're working on, you're on? Yes, so I'm, I'm, um, the next book is starting off, as I said, in the 17th century Germany, and then it, she was, uh, this woman that I'm writing about, she, uh, she was the first um, person who actually recorded and documented um, the butterfly um, metamorphosis from egg to a butterfly because at the time people didn't know how insects were born they thought that they were just created from dirt or mud um, and um, she was the first one who recorded she was interested in cut caterpillar caterpillars in particular because of their ability to change so radically and um, so in my book, this woman also changes radically. She kind of goes into a cocoon as well and um, is reborn 150 years later. So in all, in my book, she will live for 350 years. Um, but the theme of science against religion and then also the theme of insects will follow or through her story. Wow. Um, and uh, we end up with contemporary days where insects are disappearing wow. and gods sort it's of gone like as well. <laughs> science fiction, yes. <laughs> well, it's an old mm -hmm. theme from old Ovid mm. to Kafka, mm. metamorphosis. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. How did you discover this 16th century, did you say? Mm, 17th. Both, uh, 17th century mm. uh, insect uh, expert. Um, I can't remember exactly how I came across her, which is a pity. Um, but I was also already playing with the theme of metamorphosis, oh. and then I came across her and realized immediately that I have to, <laughs> yes. I have, to have her in my story. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. <laughs> so but it's been quite a different um, uh, process because this time there's very little that I can relate to yeah. in my own personal experience That's because well. of the setup yes. and, and the age, the, and a different historical age, also mm. a different culture, um, and a lot of knowledge. Um, so. Um, the amount of research that I have done through, as part of the writing process has been enormous and is continuing all through the writing process. So it's made the, the work process quite different, a lot slower as well. 
So it's, um, well, life is all about different stages of met metamorphosis mm. anyway, from child childhood to teenage to adult mm. and to old age. You could become different persons looking back. Mm. Or if you try to look back at the diary you used to write as a schoolgirl, you would mm. feel that as if it was written by someone else. Mm. Totally different. I don't know whether it happens to you mm -hmm. as a writer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, um, Celia. I hope you uh, an enjoyable trip in Hong Kong, although it's undergoing some kind of metamorphosis, hopefully, <laughs> with a lot of people, you know, feeling very excited outside. Wish you a nice thank day you. and a nice journey home, and uh, continue you. to write more stuff to surprise and. Uh, and uh, excite us in the years to come. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.